Welcome to the second part of the philosophy for the, for the public workshop. So we're starting the part on morality with Professor Richard Fincham. He's the chair of our department, the philosophy department. So basically, part one was about religion, questions concerning religion. And then part two is about morality. And this lecture is a sort of a bridge between both. So we get to question whether morality is somehow connected to religion or not. Professor Fincham is giving us that talk. They won't be revealing a lot about the talk. He talked me a lot. He told me about it. Um, but he's basically telling us about Kant, Moil Kant, first. And Professor Fincham, please welcome him with me, our chair. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for thank you for coming. Okay, so basically this, uh, uh, as you've heard, this will be a talk on is morality connected to religion? Now, I wonder, first of all, what most people would actually understand by the question, because I presume that what most people would think is that if we don't have religion, we don't have morality, that in actual fact, uh, our moral concepts and our incentives for being moral depend upon our religion. So, in other words, if, for instance, uh, somebody does not believe in God, then they simply do not have moral concepts. They don't have a concept of the moral law uh, to act upon. If, on the other hand, somebody doesn't believe in an afterlife, they don't believe in rewards in heaven or punishments in hell, maybe they haven't got the motivation, the incentive, uh, to actually act uh, morally in the first place. So in this sense, a lot of people think that morality is connected with religion within precisely this sense. They think that in actual fact, morality is in some sense dependent upon religion. And you know, this would, one could ask, well, you know, is that the case? Is it the case that morality is dependent upon religion within this sense? Well, I shall be arguing that that is precisely not the case, that in actual fact, uh, morality is not, is not dependent upon religion at all. However, that doesn't mean to say that there isn't a connection between uh, morality and religion. And in, this case, in that, that sense, I've decided to explore the, the work of a particular favorite uh, philosopher of mine, Immanuel Kant, uh, a German philosopher, uh, an Enlightenment figure who lived between 1724 uh, and 1804, almost certainly one of the most significant, uh, perhaps the most important modern philosopher since Aristotle. And the reason for his ex exploring his work, his views on the connection between morality and religion, is because he had something somewhat novel to say in this, about this question. He was not of the opinion that morality depended upon religion, but rather he argued that in actual fact the converse was the case. It is because we are moral that we have religion. Uh, because we are moral, we believe in God and we believe in the immortality of the soul. So in actual fact, as far as Kant is concerned, it is religion that is dependent upon morality. Okay, so within this talk, I'll be exploring these two uh, talks, uh, two um, fundamentally uh, important uh, uh, texts by Kant, the Critique of Pure Reason, which he worked with in 1781, which you can see there on the, uh, uh, on the left, and uh, the Metaphysics, uh, the uh, Foundations for the Metaphysics of, of Morals, which he published in 1785. Okay. But before getting into the work of Kant as an introduction, I just think it might be useful to go back to the birth of, uh, uh, of moral philosophy and to th consider uh, a question, a very important and interesting question, posed by Socrates within one of Plato's dialogues. Within Plato's early dialogue, the Euphrophro, Socrates is dramatized within the Euphrophro as meeting the priest, Euphrophro. And being a priest, of course, he claims to have some somewhat specialist knowledge. He claims to have a specialist knowledge of piety, or what we might call religiosity. That is precisely why he is a priest. 
But Socrates being Socrates, uh, of course, asks him uh, the famous Socratic question, the with some normal Socratic question, what is piety? And he therefore challenges, uh, ch he therefore challenges Euphrophro to give a logical, universal definition of this particular moral concept, piety, that Euphrophro is so convinced that he himself is an expert in. In response to Socrates' questions, Euphrophro has the following to say. He says that what is dear to the gods is pious, and what is not is impious. In other words, he's saying, well, what the gods love, that's pious, that's religious, and what they dislike, what they hate, what they despise, well, that's impious, that's irreligious. But then Socrates poses an interesting question to Euphrophro, which perplexes him somewhat. Because Socrates asks Euphrophro, but consider this, is the pious being loved by the gods because it is pious? Or is it pious because it is being loved by the gods? So what Socrates is asking there is, well, is it the case that something is pious for the pure and simple reason that the gods love it? So that, you know, if the gods happen to change their minds on occasion, then all of a sudden the pious becomes impious and the impious becomes pious. Is it, so to speak, the case that this particular moral concept of piety, is it the case that it's simply dependent upon an arbitrary choice on the part uh, of the gods? Or is it rather the case that the pious is something over and above, uh, something independent of the gods? That it's something that the gods love, it's something that the gods want, but nonetheless, what it is, is independent of their choice, their decision. Of course, these things are, as Socrates points out, completely opposite. As he says, you see they are op in opposite cases as being altogether different from each other. The second proposition is saying that the pious is determined completely by the choice of the gods. On the other hand, the, uh, the first proposition is saying that what the pious is is something that is independent, independent of the gods, uh, and that the gods love it because of what it is, because it's pious. But it's not determined, it's not chosen by them. Okay, well, you know, this Euphrophro problem, which uh, is something which, which has made this particular dialogue particular fam particularly famous, uh, is something that persists today, because, of course, we can update it somewhat in perhaps language which Kant uh, would himself have used. And we can ask the question, well, is morality willed by God because it is moral, or is something moral because it is willed by God? Okay, again, these two propositions are completely the opposite. In other words, you've got to make a choice as to which one you think is correct. You can't have both. But what the question therefore says is that in the second proposition is that, well, what is moral, what we consider to be good, could be, you know, something that is simply an arbitrary choice on God's part. On the other hand, the first proposition is actually saying that, well, no, that which is moral is something which is determined from, by sources which are independent of God's free choice. And God certainly wills that we are moral, but, uh, he, but what the moral is, what determines what is moral, is something independently of God. Uh, this is, you know, one, one could say a lot of philosophers, for instance, would say that uh, you know, there are certain things that even God is bound by. For instance, we could say that even God is bound by basic laws of uh, logic and, and mathematics, so that you know, even God could not create a three-sided square, for instance. You know, but God can create many things, but in creating many things, he has to abide by laws of logic, laws of mathematics, which are independent of his free decision. Um, what the, the first proposition here is suggesting is that in actual fact, the laws of morality, like basic laws of logic and laws of, uh, laws of mathematics, are likewise 
propositions or, or, or laws which are independent of God's free choice, which even God himself has to abide by. Okay, so um, the question therefore is, you know, is it the case that morality is determined by God or is it the case that you know, so, uh, God determines completely that which is moral? Okay, well, Kant's answer to this question is clear. He would endorse the first proposition and utterly reject the second proposition, the divine command theory of ethics, which essentially states that it is God's commands, God's free arbitrary commands perhaps, which determine that which is moral and that which we should do. This, is, this divine command theory of ethics that essentially says that morality is dependent upon God is something that Kant rejects. And we can see his rejection of this within these, uh, uh, these two quotations, one from the Critique of Pure Reason and one from the uh, Grounding for the Metaphysics of Morals. Well, what Kant is basically suggesting within those, uh, those two quotations uh, taken together would be th is this. Um, First of all, well, for one thing, as he says, well, we cannot intuit divine perfection. You know, morality is something which should concern us at each and every moment of our lives. Uh, you know, it, it's, it, we should not, therefore, infer moral laws from something that is uh, uh, mysterious and hides behind the clouds, or in Kant's uh, terminology, hides uh, behind the, uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, material world or the world of appearances. Uh, but there's also, there's also another problem here in that Kant thinks that in most cases, those people who are committed to the divine command theory of ethics are actually guilty of circularity. Because if you ask them, well, you know, why is it that uh, uh, you think that that which God commands is moral? Why is it that you think that that which God commands is, uh, uh, constitutes a series of laws that you should obey? Well, probably their answer would be, well, God is, because God is good, because he constitutes the greatest, most morally perfect being, because he is omnibenevolent. But as Kant points out, that commits you to a kind of logical... Um, inconsistency or logical fallacy a kind of uh, that commits you to circular reasoning because essentially what you are doing there is you're forming a concept of god as the most morally perfect being from a prior conception of morality so in that sense the people who are actually saying uh, that in actual fact our morality depends upon God and God's free choice, are actually really guilty of circularity because they've attained their concept of God, their thought of God, from a previously existing, independently determined concept of morality. Okay. Um, okay. Um, another, but then if we say, well, okay, that's, that's, if somebody, somebody denies that, if, uh, so then if, if they haven't done that, if they haven't uh, uh, attained their concept of God uh, from a prior independent uh, source of morality, then basically then, if they really do think that uh, what we call morality and what the actions that we should do are really dependent upon these these free choices then essentially they're making god into into a tyrant tyrant a kind of dictator who just says that absolutely all human beings should uh, act in accordance with what he wishes whatever he wishes so that if he suddenly changes his mind and thinks that uh, uh, torturing uh, uh, torturing innocent people is a good thing to do then torturing innocent people would be a moral thing to do but of course, we don't think that God's likely to do that, do we? Why? Because we regard him as, uh, um, as, as, as morally perfect. But in, if, if we acknowledge the second fact, the second uh, proposition, then we're kind of acknowledging that in actual fact our concepts of morality do actually derive from a completely independent source. They don't simply derive from the, the will of God. Okay. But then, you know, another point might be, uh, we can move on to a, a second quote here from one of Kant's early works, The Dreams of a Spirit Seer. Um, Kant here, here is then asking about 
virtue um, and what makes a person virtuous. And he's asking here about, uh, you know, is, is it the case um, that uh, when, when, when we, we judge human beings as, as virtuous or otherwise, do we really think that somebody who performs virtuous actions simply because of their uh, desire to attain to paradise or that they, so to speak, uh, want to avoid the fires of hell, do we actually think that such a person is, is moral, is virtuous? Surely, as Kant is suggesting there, surely being virtuous uh, actually consists in performing virtue for its own sake. Thinking that there, thinking that there is actually something that is uh, uh, a, a unconditioned uh, value about particular actions, uh, you know, surely that is uh, that is the person who is who is uh, who is virtuous, or rather, if we're talking about morality, well, you know, maybe you know the person who who is moral for its own sake, surely that constitutes a truly moral person, and somebody who is performing moral actions, well, just because they desire to attain to paradise or simply because they uh, um, uh, fear the wrath of God, well, maybe that person actually isn't, isn't really moral at all. And Kant actually thinks, you know, Kant is uh, uh, really a, a descriptivist um, philosopher, not a uh, prescriptivist philosopher. He's not actually change, is seeking to change our views upon the world. What he's actually claiming is that what, what he's actually claiming is that uh, actually this is the way in which most of us think anyway. You know, he thinks that most of us really would be of the opinion that somebody who performs morally good actions simply because they see that those actions have value within their own right is far better than somebody who is performing the very same actions but in order to attain some sort of benefit for themselves they're in there by doing, performing those actions. So, you know, let's consider uh, two men, and let's say that these, these men are both sort of great benefactors to a, a charitable organization. Uh, both men give a lot of money to charity. Well, let's say that the first man is giving that money to charity because he sees that benefiting others, benefiting people in need, is a fundamentally good thing to do. It's the right thing to do uh, for intrinsic reasons. It is an intrinsically good thing to do. On the other hand, maybe the other person, giving, he's giving exactly the same amount of money to charity, but maybe he's only doing that because he wants to attain a place in heaven. Maybe secretly he despises the people that he's actually uh, uh, giving this money to. Maybe secretly, you know, he regards them all as a bunch of lazy scroungers. Uh, but nonetheless, if we think of the consequences of their actions, both the consequences of the actions of these two people are the same. They both give uh, money to charity, perhaps the same amount of money. Okay, well, do we regard them as both, uh, uh, morally speaking, on the same level? Is one of those men better than the other? Well, Kant would actually say, well, everybody, all of us, the co common sense, the common un basic common understanding tells us that the person who is benefiting others because they see that such a course of action has intrinsic value and intrinsic worth is obviously better than the person who is benefiting others just because they want to attain a place in heaven. Uh, and in actual fact, the second person, Kant would say, is not actually moral at all. What they are doing has absolutely no moral worth whatsoever. Only the first person, as far as Kant is concerned, is moral. Okay. Okay, so if we just move on uh, to just, just, I'll just say something now about Kant's own position now to introduce you know, what, what, he's, what, I, what I said at the beginning about how Kant conceives of the connection between morality and religion. Well, Kant's philosophy is... Uh, uh, a lot of it is divided into two fundamental parts. The theoretical philosophy, uh, which is concerned with what is and what exists, and on the other hand, the 
practical philosophy, as he calls it, which is the, precisely the moral philosophy or the ethical philosophy, the philosophy that is concerned with what ought to be. Now, with regard to religion and religious questions, Kant's theoretical philosophy is almost entirely negative. In actual fact, you know, at the time he was regarded by uh, uh, a Jewish philosopher, Moses Mendelssohn, uh, as the great destroyer because within his 800 word, uh, 800, 800 page uh, critique of pure reason, um, Kant had effectively critically examined and destroyed all of the traditional arguments for the existence of God and the immortality of the soul. The ontological argument and the cosmological argument, both of which you know, attempt to say uh, that we can know the existence of God in much the same way that we can know the result of a mathematical formula, and the teleological argument that essentially claims that we can prove the existence of God in the same way that we can prove a hy scientific hypothesis, uh, Kant had decided that, uh, had uh, attempted to prove that all of these arguments are actually fallacious, or they're all subject to skeptical attack. And so, essentially, what Kant proves with regard to religion within his theoretical philosophy is very negative. In actual fact, you know, he claims that we simply cannot know that there is a God, and you know, we simply cannot know that the soul is immortal. We cannot know that there is an afterlife. We can't know these things in the same way that we can know mathematical truths or scientific truths, scientific facts. Okay. But, as he famously claims in the Critique of Pure Reason, he has been forced to deny knowledge in order to make room for faith. Because, in actual fact, you know, when, when we talk about having faith in God and belief in God, we're surely uh, acknowledging the fact that we're not s certain of the existence of God, and we're not, you know, we're not certain as the existence of the immortality of the soul in the way that we are, uh, that we are certain of... Uh, uh, Pythagoras' theorem, for example. Um, you know, so um, no one, however, would claim that uh, they have faith in a mathematical proposition. No, we, or a mathematical truth. No, we know math the mathematical truths. We have knowledge of mathematics. With God and immortality, however, we're dealing with something which is, which is much more uncertain. And in that sense, we can only have faith. So, you know, in talk, when we talk about faith and distinguish it from knowledge, we're essentially acknowledging, at least Kant says, uh, that uh, those things in which we have faith, we are, in a sense, less certain of uh, than we are certain uh, of truths of mathematics or, or scientific truths. Okay. Um, so, and we see that in the fact that, you know, if somebody disagrees with us with regard to a mathematical proposition or, uh, you know, a scientific proposition, well, I can, just, I can just prove to them that they are wrong. I can demonstrate to them the, the falsity of their own position. On the other hand, you know, if somebody disagrees with me about the existence of God or the immortality of the soul, there's really very little I can do as far as Kant is concerned. Nonetheless, as far as he's concerned, if one is moral, if one is a moral, uh, a rational being uh, with a moral disposition, then one necessarily has faith in God and faith in an afterlife because he precisely connects morality and religion in this, this uh, slightly um, counterintuitive manner whereby he essentially says that our religion is in actual fact dependent uh, upon our morality. So, as I've said there, you know, basically, as far as Kant is concerned, uh, we don't uh, need religion to lead us into morality. It's rather the case that we need morality to lead us into religion. Okay. Well, what is morality as far as Kant is concerned? Well, as I said earlier, um, Kant uh, divides his philosophy into two parts, the theoretical philosophy concerned with what is, or as I've uh, described it here in formulation from the uh, 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 grounding for the metaphysics of morals, what does happen? Uh, so basically, you know, within, uh, theor within uh, theoretical philosophy, 
or um, theoretical reason or is precisely concerned uh, with uh, that, that which exists within the world, that which we can uh, know to exist in the world, that which happens within the world, and that which we can know to happen uh, within the world. And Kant thinks that when we're dealing with uh, these uh, with, uh, with theoretical reason turns to the world, uh, there are two kinds of truths that it finds concerning the world. So there were some things about the world, uh, Kant says, that we simply know a priori, or basically, which of course means that we know before experience. Uh, there are some things which uh, you know, we, we, we simply know. We don't uh, uh, have to test them. We don't have to uh, perform experiments to see whether they're true or not. Uh, we simply know that they are, these propositions are valid of the world. And Kant thinks that any proposition, any proposition that we find within physics or metaphysics, which is necessarily and universally true, in other words, it must be true, and it's true in all possible circumstances, well, this constitutes uh, an a priori truth, which is therefore, sort of, so to speak, part of pure physics. So, as far as Kant is concerned, there is uh, something which constitutes pure physics, or a metaphysics of nature. There are propositions, for instance, that in all changes within the material world, the quantity of matter remains unchanged. There are propositions like that, which are not actually proven within physics, but are rather presupposed within all physical proofs. So basically, you know, Kant thinks that even within, so to speak, emp empirical physics has as its basis a series of pure, necessarily and, necessary and universal truths, or a priori truths, which are not based upon experience. Well, why am I just talking about all of this? Well, I'm talking about this because, uh, as I've illustrated here on the, uh, the presentation, well, Kant thinks that exactly the same uh, kind of relation between uh, pure and empirical components also exists for practical reason. Because practical reason, our practical reason, is very much concerned with, well, what we should do, what the world ought to be like, what human beings ought to do, what we should do. And Kant thinks that, well, basically, there are two different kinds of inquiries when practical reason turns itself to the question of what we should do. Because, you know, that we, you, I could say to you, for example, you know, if, if you're students, that, you know, if you want to get a good job, uh, then you should really study really hard. Well, is that, however, a moral law? Well, Kant says no. Basically, something like that is simply uh, what Kant would call a pragmatic rule of prudence. And Kant thinks that there are various sort of pragmatic rules of prudence uh, which are telling us how to be happy. You know, if you want to be, we all want to be happy, as far as Kant is, is convinced. We all, we all want to be happy all of the time. Uh, we don't really know what happiness consists in. We all often have very, very different ideas as to what happiness consists in. Uh, and which is why, in one sense, when we're talking about happiness and how to attain happiness within this world, there are no necessarily in universal rules. Because you know, what is happiness for one person within this world might differ from what is happy of happiness to another person. We all want to be happy, but we're not really quite sure uh, what exactly happiness is. So, you know, we all have different ideas as to what happiness uh, actually is, and so therefore we all, so to speak, follow different imperatives or different rules in order to attain happiness. And sure enough, there are, you know, no end of people, uh, no shortage of people out there telling us what to do in order to attain happiness. You know, you can go to the AUC bookstore and uh, uh, pick up a few uh, self-help books, and you know, there's many, many people telling you how to be, how to be happy and lead a good life and uh, uh, how to earn a, lot, take, earn a lot of money and this kind of thing. Well, but how that has got nothing to do with morality, as far as Kant is concerned. So basically, any kind of rule whatsoever, any kind of advice, uh, that is telling you what to do in order to, uh, in order to be happy, 
Um, there's nothing moral about that whatsoever. As far as Kant is concerned, basically morality mirrors uh, that pure component of physics. It's as far as moral laws are necessary and universal laws which tell us what we should do, what we must do, in all possible circumstances. And so, you know, moral laws do not change over time. They don't differ from one place to, a ne uh, one place to the next. What is moral remains the same uh, and is the same at all times and in all places. And what is moral also is not, we're not in any way, um, we're not in any way uh, uh, in pursuit of happiness uh, in following a moral law. Because, you know, basically, as we, basically, as we said, you know, we, we in that, my, the previous example that I gave, uh, if we consider the man who is uh, giving lots of money to charity, but, you know, secretly he despises the people that he's benefiting, and, you know, really, he's only giving that money to charity because, uh, uh, you know, he wants to attain a place in heaven. Well, you know, we say, well, why does he want to attain a place in heaven? Well, because he, you know, he, he thinks that, that that's going to... Uh, uh, to make him happy. Uh, no, 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 there's, there's, there's nothing actually moral about that whatsoever. Um, on the other, such a person there is just simply following uh, a law of, uh, of prudence, uh, a pragmatic law of prudence in order to attain happiness. He's not, be, he's not moral at all. On the other hand, you know, uh, basically, if um, following moral laws, uh, as far as Kant is concerned, it's got actually enough, very little to do uh, with happiness, or certainly not with happiness within this life. Because frequently, doing the right thing and, and being moral uh, it might actually make us personally very unhappy indeed. And yet, that doesn't, deny, that doesn't in any way um, deviate from the fact that in actual fact, we still must... Uh, be moral, and we should be moral, and we ought to be moral, even if uh, performing such moral actions, in actual fact, is makes us very, very unhappy indeed. So, in actual fact, can't, what actually Kant says is that uh, morality or moral laws teaches how to be worthy of happiness. They're not actually going to make us happy, uh, not within this life anyway. But nonetheless, they teach us how to be such that we are deserving of happiness. Again, if we go back to the two men, uh, the one who gives money to charity because he thinks that there's something intrinsically good about doing that, and the other person who, you know, who uh, is simply uh, uh, giving money to charity in order to attain a place in heaven, well, you know, the, the second person surely uh, doesn't, uh, in a sense, deserve happiness you know he's he's acting because he wants to attain happiness but surely he doesn't actually deserve it he's not worthy of happiness on the other hand the person who is uh uh giving money to charity because he just thinks that there is something intrinsically good about doing that well surely that person is actually worthy of happiness Surely, you know, in, in, act, in seeing that moral laws have their own intrinsic, unconditioned value and acting in accordance with them, not because one wants to uh, attain something, not because one is uh, acting out of any, uh, any incentive for one's own benefit, but simply insofar as one uh, thinks that those, those moral laws actually are giving us prescriptions that uh, really have, you know, unconditioned value. Uh, that's the person who should be happy. That's the person who is worthy of being happy, whether they are happy or not. And of course, you know, we frequently see within the world all around us that often the most moral people are the most uh, unhappy people. And often, of course, um, the converse is also the case. People who are very immoral often tend to attain quite a degree of happiness. Okay. Um, okay. So, Kant actually says, then he makes an important distinction between different kinds of uh, imperatives. Well, you know, any kind of uh, where practical reason is telling us what we should do and what we ought to do, it's putting forward an imperative. Any statement 
uh, that's telling you what you should do is, uh, as, is referred to as an imperative. It's a kind of, it's advice, uh, it's, or it's, it's a command. Uh, it's therefore what we call an imperative. Okay, now, one finds, for example, imperatives within science. Uh, you know, very simply, Kant gives the example that if one wishes to bisect a line, then one must draw intersecting arcs from each of its extremities. You know, very simply, if you want to do that, if you want to do that within the, uh, the uh, context of some technical drawing you're doing or whatever, then basically that's what you do. You know, to, to divide a line into two uh, equal parts, then construct ar ar arcs from its uh, ex extremities. Okay, um, and also, you know, when we're in practical anthropology, when we're dealing with, you know, how to be happy, when we go to the AUC bookstore and we get some self-help books and those, those books are telling us, you know, how to have a good life and how to attain happiness and, and that kind of thing, well, basically what we're being given there is a series of hypothetical imperatives. You know, people are telling us that if you want to attain happiness or if you want to attain a lot of money, then this is what you should do. Okay, so, but Kant says, well, hypothetical imperatives have got nothing to do with morality. In morality, rather, we find what Kant refers to as categorical imperatives. Because, remember, as far as Kant is concerned, moral laws are, by definition, necessary and universal laws. They're laws that you must follow at all times, but not for any particular reason, not in, in order to attain something, not in order to attain happiness, or not in order to attain a place in heaven. You simply must do them. You should do them. You ought to do them. Uh, so therefore, you know, they're, they're, they're somewhat different. I mean, the, the statement of the two uh, moral laws, or the two categorical imperatives that we have here, as you can see, uh, function very differently from the two... Uh, hypothetical imperatives that I've, I've uh, um, sketched there on, on the presentation. So, for instance, you know, Kant's uh, famous formulation of the most basic and supreme of all the categorical imperatives, act according to the maxim which uh, can at the same time make itself into a universal law. It's not saying, well, you should act like that in order to attain something. It's simply saying, you must act like that. You should act like that. You ought to act like that. Similarly, another proposition, another moral law, as far as Kant is concerned, one should not make a false promise. That's something that you just should never do. I'm not saying that you, you, you should not make a false promise because then people won't like you and then you'll be unhappy. It's simply saying, no, you should not make a false promise doesn't matter about what the context is, it doesn't matter about what the circumstances are, it doesn't matter about whether, in actual fact, in some circumstances, perhaps making a false promise might make you very happy indeed, it might bring you a great deal of wealth or something, uh, but you still should never do it. So categorical imperatives are therefore very, very different, uh, very mysterious uh, from uh, in relation to uh, other kinds of imperatives, because they're not advising us, they're not saying that in order to attain something you should do this, they're simply, simply saying you should do this under all circumstances. And basically, as far as Kant thinks, only moral laws uh, can be categorical imperatives. All moral laws, therefore, are categorical imperatives. Okay. Okay, so, well, as I've already said, uh, Kant, uh, you know, s sketches and describes the, uh, the categorical imperative through this proposition that one should act according to that maxim which can at the same time make itself a universal law. That, as far as Kant is concerned, is the supreme principle of all morality from which all other moral propositions, all moral laws are derived. Well, you know, you might, well, might ask the question, well, where exactly does he get that proposition from? Well, you can see the, uh, the justification within this uh, quotation at the top from the, the, fa uh, the grounding for the metaphysics of morals. Kant says that you know, he's simply sure that for something to be a moral law, it should not be done for a particular reason. It should not be, be done in order to attain happiness. So it's not a law that is, a moral law is not a law that is in pursuit of a particular end, uh, 
uh, a particular goal. So therefore, as far as Kant is concerned, uh, when a rational being is, uh, desires to be moral, basi uh, basically what we're doing is we're simply desiring lawfulness as such. And that's basically what the, the this supreme principle of morality uh, is expressing, lawfulness as such. We say act according to the maxim, which could at the same time make itself a universal law. Basically what Kant is saying there is that you should, you should, you ought, to always act in such a way that you can actually consistently will that absolutely all people are acting in precisely the same way that you're acting. And if you can't consistently will that all people are acting in the same way that you're acting, if you are making yourself, or you wish to make yourself, an exception, then there is something immoral about what you are doing. Okay. Kant then gives uh, this uh, categorical imperative, the uh, supreme principle of all morality, uh, three other formulations. Although he says that fundamentally they're all more or less expressing the same thing. Well, one formulation is act as if the maxim of your action were to become, uh, through your will, a universal law of nature. Well, that's quite clear what that means. You know, if it's the case that, uh, uh, you know, as I say, if you should act in such a way that the maxim of your action is a universal law, then basically you should act in such a way, you should only do things that you can consistently desire that all other people are also doing. You know, if you can't desire that all people are doing what you're doing now, then there is something immoral about what you were doing. If, on the other hand, you can consistently desire that people are doing what you're doing now, then what you're doing is moral. Okay, so that's quite clear. But then in the next formulation, uh, Kant uh, uh, refers to the beings who are subject to this law. And you know, just as it's the case that moral laws are unconditionally valid, uh, they, you know, they, they don't, uh, they're not there in order to uh, uh, attain another end. So it's also the case that the beings that act uh, morally are also unconditioned ends. Uh, so Kant says that we could also express this proposition that we should act in such a way that you treat humanity, whether in your own person or in the person of another, always at the same time and as, as an end and never simply as a means. And what Kant is there expressing is that we should always treat ourselves, but also all other human beings, as if they have an unconditioned value, an unconditioned dignity. And we shouldn't treat people as means. In other words, we shouldn't treat people as instruments to uh, attaining goals of our own. We shouldn't exploit people. That's what Kant means by treating people as a means. We should always acknowledge that all human beings have an unconditioned worth and an unconditioned dignity and that they should not be exploited. And that is also a formulation regarding the categorical imperative. Well, Kant says if we then put those two formulations together, we then get another formulation of the categorical imperative, which is the idea of the will of every rational being as a will that legislates universal law. So basically, you know, we as rational beings, we have an unconditioned dignity, an unconditioned worth. We're not, uh, you know, there's, we're, there's nothing valuable about us because, for some particular reason. It's rather the case we are valuable in ourselves. We have, therefore, an unconditioned dignity and worth. And we also supply moral laws which also have unconditioned dignity and worth, and which are prescribing that we should treat ourselves and each and, other, each and every human being as if they have an unconditioned worth. And so, basically, if you see where exactly 
I mean, this, this, this uh, final uh, formulation of the categorical imperative tells us, as far as Kant is concerned, where exactly it is that the moral law comes from. Where does morality come from? And it comes from human reason, or rather, it comes from reason as such. It comes from the will of each and every rational being. So it's us, we are the people who formulate the moral law precisely because we are rational human beings. In precisely in that, that is, uh, gives us as human beings our value and our dignity. For Kant thinks there is actually something somewhat undignified uh, about uh, attaining one's uh, moral concepts from another source, a heteronymous source. You know, there's something slightly undignified about being a proponent of the divine command theory of ethics. Uh, it's much uh, more in accord with the dignity and value of human beings, Kant thinks, to think of ourselves as the authors of uh, the, the moral law. Okay, but basically Kant's very careful here. He also says, he does, it's not just, I, I, I slipped up just a second ago because I said, well, it's, it's human reason that forms the, the, the moral law. In actual fact, no, it isn't. It's the will of every rational being uh, that uh, forms and constitutes the moral law. So, of course, it's also the case that, that you know, to this, this, this kind of philosophy, it's still the case that, that God is moral and, and God is wills and commands precisely the same actions that we will and consider as things that we ought to do. But it's not the case that God is, that God is so to speak, granting us and... Uh, uh, forcing his conception of morality upon us, it's rather the case that, uh, that God's conception of morality and our conception of morality perfectly agree with each other insofar as God and me, myself, and you, yourself, hopefully, you know, we are all rational human beings, or we're all rational, and insofar as one is a free, rational being, then uh, the laws of morality, uh, these moral laws, follow immediately from one's nature. Okay, um, let's just uh, very quickly to then see how Kant uh, derives uh, uh, other moral duties from these rather abstract formulations. Uh, well, first of all, let's just concentrate on the duties to others. Uh, very, very famous example, uh, well, Kant says, we should never lie. Never. There's no such thing about as a white lie as far as Kant is concerned. Because, you know, as far as Kant is concerned, moral laws are necessarily and universally valid. Uh, they're, they're necessarily and universally telling you what you should do under each and every possible circumstance. And so Kant is therefore telling us that we should never lie. It is never moral to lie. It is always moral to tell the truth. Okay, well, why is that? Why does he, how does he manage to derive that uh, from this uh, categorical imperative? Act according to the maxim, which can at the same time make itself a universal law. Well, quite simply, because for the pure and simple reason that if I am going to tell a lie, if I'm going to lie to you and, uh, and I hope and I want my lie to be effective, well, it presupposes that you're actually going to believe that what I'm telling you is true. And so lying only actually makes sense. It only actually functions. It can only actually be effective within a society and within a community in which, for the most part, people tell the truth and people expect others to tell the truth. And so therefore, when I lie, I am making myself an exception. I'm standing outside of this community of people who normally tell the truth uh, in order to uh, further my own ends, my own uh, material ends, whatever they may be. Okay. But of course, you know, this is derived from the categorical imperative because we simply can't consistently and coherently will when we are lying that our actions become a, could be conceived as a universal law. 
Because as I say, you know, if I tell a lie, my lie can only be effective in a community in which people normally tell the truth. And so when I lie, I can't will that my action be a universal law. I can't universalize, consistently will that my action is universalized, because that would be willing that I'm actually in a community in which everybody lies. In which case, there would be no point in actually lying anyway to further my ends, because if everybody lies, then nobody would believe me. So in that sense, you know, we, we, lying is by definition wrong for the pure and simple reason that it's not something that's universalizable. It's something that we should never, ever do. And of course, also, of course, it also points out in lying to other people, you are also treating the people you are lying to as a means. Uh, you're uh, treating them as, as instruments to you know, attaining your, your own particular uh, materialistic goals, whatever they might be. Uh, another, uh, another moral duty, uh, benefit others, you know, give to charity. Kant says that uh, this is an imperfect duty. It's not like uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the duty to tell the truth, because the duty to tell the truth is binding within absolutely all circumstances. Uh, on the other hand, you know, giving to charity is something that we, we ought to do, but we're not required to give to each and every charity. You know, we're not required to uh, throw a, a 20 pound note at every beggar we meet on the street. Uh, you know, uh, these, the, the, uh, the, the duty to benefit others uh, tolerates omissions in that sense, but it's still the case that it's something that we should do. Why is it something that we should do? Well, very simply, you know, we can't will that this would be uh, a, that not giving to charity, that not benefiting others, become a universal law for the pure and simple reason that we may ourselves be in need ourselves at some point. We might uh, uh, require charity ourselves at some point. And so, in that sense, um, Kant thinks that these these basic moral duties can be derived from this categorical imperative, which is likewise derived from just this will, de desire for just lawfulness in hu uh, regarding human actions in general. Okay, well, furthermore, it's precisely because uh, we have these, uh, we, we are aware of moral laws and we are aware of categorical imperatives in this sense, it's precisely this that as far as Kant concerns, is concerned, uh, gives us uh, our freedom of the will. It gives us free choice, or it gives us what he refers to as, as practical freedom. As far as he's concerned, you know, well, animals are determined purely by sensory stimuli. Animals make choices. But for instance, to quote an example from another philosopher, uh, let's say that uh, I'm out walking with my dog, and on the one hand, uh, my, my dog all of a sudden scents, gets the scent of a female dog, and it suddenly you know, runs in that direction, you know, wants to, uh, uh, urgent uh, desire to, uh, uh, to procreate. But on the other hand, you know, I call my dog and I t tell it, you know, come here now, and uh, you know, I might uh, have, a, have a biscuit in my hand to reward it, or you know, my dog might uh, realize that I'm you know, a very strict master who might beat it if uh, it doesn't do uh, precisely what I want it to do. And so you can see in those cases, you can see that animals make choices in the sense that the dog might actually stand there and think, well, do I go after the, uh, the nice female dog that uh, I can smell over there, or do I simply go back to my master and uh, be a, uh, an obedient animal? Um, so that is, so to speak, a choice, but it's not a free choice. It's completely and utterly uh, determined by animalistic desires. And what the dog chooses to do will be determined purely by which desire is more forceful, by what the dog desires most. On the other hand, 
the case of human beings, well, we're much more complex. I mean, on the one hand, we have the same desires as the dog. But we also have reason. We're also rational beings. And so because we're rational beings, we have within our minds these concepts of moral duties, such as that we should never lie and uh, that we should uh, benefit others. Um, and, and so that you know, we should act in such a way that the maximum of our action can always be willed as if it were a universal law. Now, Kant thinks that it's precisely that that gives us an awareness of our freedom. Because on the one hand, okay, he thinks that there's, there's the, the fact that we are aware of these moral duties means that we're not simply like animals, completely and utterly determined by uh, that which we see and that which we smell and that which we desire in order to attain pleasure or other forms of happiness, but rather we have this rational consciousness of precisely what we should do. We have these concepts of moral laws and, and duties. And those, therefore, we are free insofar as we have a freedom from our rational nature. And the fact that we, are, we had this, this moment of negative freedom, whereby we are free from our animal nature, we're not simply uh, automata in the same way that Kant thinks animals are, uh, the fact that that is the case also, at one and the same time, means that we are conscious of the moral law. Because Kant is actually, actually thinks that, well, and when we talk about freedom, we're not necessarily talking about you know, simply being able to arbitrarily do what you want. It might simply be the case that freedom itself produces laws. And Kant thinks that in actual fact, a free being is a being who is aware of the moral law and aware of what it should do. On the other hand, animals are function purely in accordance with their nature, purely in accordance with uh, laws of biology, which are ultimately reducible to the laws of physics. Well, in that sense, we, we are rational animals, which means that we, so to speak, on the one hand, are, uh, provide uh, an example of this particular site in which these two different kinds of laws interact. On the one hand, we are animals who, just like other animals, are subject to particular desires, uh, you know, desires for food and desires for sex and desires for other forms of pleasure and desires for wealth and all these kinds of things. But on the other hand, we are rational beings who are very, very conscious of what we, uh, what we ought to do. And the very, very, the very fact that those con that consciousness of what we ought to do, those moral laws, um, they show us that we're actually f we can render ourselves free of our animal nature. And it's, it's precisely, therefore, our consciousness of our moral laws that makes us free. And so you know, freedom is itself law-governed. It is uh, subject to laws. It's just freedom precisely is, to be free, is to be subject to moral laws. Okay? To, um, that's, on the other hand, an animal doesn't have freedom, it doesn't have free will, because it's purely and utterly subject to the laws of nature. We, on the other hand, are subject to both laws. Okay. Kant gives a very um, interesting example of this. Uh, where he, one example that he gives is the, this idea of a prince who... You, know, what you, you live in a particular kingdom, and the prince in this particular kingdom wants, to, wants you to go to court and give a, uh, under oath, give a false testimony against, against a, an honorable man, uh, which could result in this honorable man being unfairly and wrongly sentenced to death. And the prince says, well, unless, unless, you, uh, unless you go to court, and you swear under oath, and you give this false testimony, you lie in court, 
uh, in such a way, and it's such a lie that could, uh, you know, result in your own death or the death of your family or whatever. Uh, um, you know, um, so, and, and then the, the Kant says, well, you know, what, what actually would we do in those cases, in that case, if, if you know, because Kant, Kant, of course, thinks that we should never lie. You know, it's, it's always wrong to lie. It's uh, a moral duty that always to tell the truth. But if, so to speak, we're, um, you know, we are being coerced under the threat of death and perhaps, you know, with threats against uh, the lives of our family as well to, to lie, what would we do? Well, Kant thinks that probably 99% of people, perhaps even more, would lie in order to preserve your life, in order to preserve the life of your family, you know, most of us would decide to tell a lie. Okay. But it's still, still the wrong thing to do. And Kant thinks that even when we're placed in that situation, and we're, we are, so to speak, coerced to go into court or uh, and under oath to, to lie in court, uh, to damage uh, the reputation of an honorable, honorable man within court, we are st still conscious that we ought to do something else. So we're still conscious that what we are doing is wrong, even though most of us would probably do the immoral thing within that situation. And Kant says that that consciousness precisely provides uh, a consciousness of our freedom. This fact that we're always conscious that there is... Uh, that, that, that we perhaps ought to have done something else is a consciousness that we should, so to speak, render us, ourselves free from our animal nature and our desires and our emotions and that we should simply do that which the moral law commands. Okay. So, um, moving on. Okay, well, okay, very, simply, uh, very simply, just to... Uh, to make the one very simple point, it's precisely because we are both animals and also rational beings that we say that moral laws prescribed laws that we ought to do. We say that uh, there are duties which we ought to do. Now, if we didn't have an animalistic nature, then it's the case that we would simply be living in accordance with the laws of freedom in the same way that animals live according to the laws of nature and are subject to the laws of nature, purely spiritual beings, departed souls, angels and God, live according simply to the laws of freedom. And so, therefore, for God, there is nothing, so to speak, that God ought to do. There are only, so to speak, moral laws that God would do or even for a perfectly holy will, such a will, the moral laws for such a will would be, pro would be laws that, the, that the, such a will would do. We, on the other hand, when we're talking about morality, speak about oughts. We talk about the moral ought, what we ought to do and what we should do. And that's precisely because we are both rational and animal. And so within a given situation, you know, such as this, this example that I just gave you about, you know, should, should we uh, lie in court if our lives are being threatened? Well, in that situation, it's never completely clear what we would do. And so in that case, uh, you can simply say, okay, well, you, you ought not to lie. That's for certain. But nonetheless, you know, because of our animal nature, because we have a nature that is constantly seeking pleasure and constantly seeking happiness, at least, well, you know, it might well be the case that we would do something else. Okay, so moving on, Kant thinks, therefore, that, well, rational beings, as rational beings, uh, we are uh, free. But as free, rational beings, we are subject to moral laws. It's precisely because we are subject to moral laws, laws which follow from our free, rational nature. Uh, that's, that is, so to speak, what, what makes us free. Okay, well, Kant thinks we could, we could imagine 
what it would be like if we could abstract from our animal nature. We could uh, abstract from the, our inclinations, our animalistic inclinations, our desires for pleasure, um, our desires for happiness, and to simply imagine all of us living together as a community of rational beings, all of us acting purely rationally all of the time. Well, in such a, such a situation, uh, we would have more, almost, we could say, heaven upon earth. If absolutely all of us were doing what we should do all of the times, we were always treating each other as ends, never as means. We were never uh, exploiting others. We were never using others as, as instruments. Well, then we would have, so to speak, heaven on earth. There would, as far as Kant is concerned, in such a situation in which everybody was purely rational, uh, there would be a proportionality between worthiness to be happy and happiness. Uh, okay. The problem is, however, is that this can never be found. Um, this, this is something which we actually don't have within this life, but it is a necessary idea. The very fact, therefore, that we are, we are rational beings means uh, that uh, subject to moral laws means that we must form within our heads this idea of a moral world, a moral world in which all people were simply acting purely rationally, treating each and every person as ends, always performing their moral duties in each and every circumstance. In such a situation, we would have what Kant thinks a system of uh, self-rewarding happiness, or what Kant refers to as, as a moral world. Okay. Um, So when we think of ourselves as moral, rational beings, we must think of this, this moral world in which everybody is behaving morally. You know, it's some sort of ideal that we ought to realize, that we ought to bring about within this world. Uh, we ought to try and get this, this world to try and emulate and reflect this moral idea. But unfortunately, you know, we, we never can because even if, even if we're perfectly moral ourselves, it's always the case that there were other people who are going to be immoral around us. There were other people who were following their uh, animalistic inclinations. And so, you know, we can, never, we can never experience this moral world in which uh, uh, worthiness to be happy and, or morality and, uh, um, and, ha and, and happiness are actually proportional to one another. And so, therefore, what should we do? Because Kant thinks, on the one hand, we have, as human beings, we're aware of being parts of nature, and we see that nature is subject to various laws, laws of physics around us, but we're also rational beings, free and autonomous rational beings, who also belong to a moral world that is governed by laws of freedom or, or moral laws. And unfortunately, we can't actually see how these two worlds can cohere together, unless the moral world is something that could be brought about and attained by a God within a future life. And so, in this sense, Kant is, tells us that in order to preserve the system of morality, in order to conceive of it as possible in the future, that happiness might indeed be proportional to our worthiness of happiness, or happiness might indeed be proportional to morality, we have to believe within a God and a future life in order that we can actually make sense of how it is that we are subject to uh, these two different kinds of laws, 
So we are, you know, we are governed, we, we see around us uh, and, and the universe as, as being a system of governed by laws of nature, uh, but as free moral beings, we're also conscious of ourselves as being part of a moral system, a, a moral world in which uh, virtue and happiness are proportional. And yet, unfortunately, these two, these two systems, these two worlds, contradict with, e with each other uh, because it, it doesn't seem as if, you know, within the world of nature, it frequently seems as if those people who are actually immoral seem to be uh, very often uh, the happiest individuals. And those people who are very, very moral often seem to be, you know, conversely, they seem to be the most unhappy individuals. Uh, so, you know, how can we therefore consistently think of ourselves as being both members of the natural world and also members of this, this moral world? Well, Kant says that this is, this is only possible insofar as we uh, conceive of there being a God who s makes sure that in actual fact, within the fullness of time, it is the case that happiness will conform to worthiness to be happy within a future life. And so, in this case, Kant argues that belief in a God and belief in a future life follow inexorably from our moral disposition because we cannot be moral beings uh, without postulating the existence of God or and the existence of a future life. Okay. Um, you know, does that mean, I mean, Kant says, you know, we can formulate this argument, Kant says at one point within the critique of pure reason, they're saying that it comes down to the inference that something is because something ought to happen, which, you know, seems a slightly uh, um, unconvincing. It seems a bit like a classic case of the normative fallacy. But Kant's not saying that, well, we can prove the existence of God because something ought to happen. He's not saying that we can prove the existence of God in the way that we can, we can prove uh, a mathematical proposition or that we can prove uh, um, a scientific theory. Uh, no, basically what he's saying is that we, uh, we must believe in something. We must have faith in something because something ought to happen. And you know, this moral world of which we are a part ought to be realizable. And so therefore, we must inexorably have faith, hope that indeed this moral world will be realizable in the future. And the only way that it could be realizable is if there is a God who ensures within a future life that uh, happiness and worthiness to be happy are in proportion. And so, in that sense, uh, Kant says that it's our morality that gives us necessarily faith uh, within faith or belief. In German, the word's the same, faith or belief in God. Okay, um, just to, to wrap up very quickly, um, one thing, advantage of this is that, well, Kant actually thinks that this moral argument actually gives us the conception of God that most people actually believe in. You know, Kant thinks that, uh, in actual fact, this, that's an advantage that is not actually possessed with all the classical uh, arguments for God's existence that one has found within uh, previous metaphysics. Well, okay, you know, there's the ontological argument. Well, the ontological argument proves that something must necessarily exist. Well, but that thing that necessarily exists, it could be anything. It could be matter itself. Well, there's the cosmological argument that proves that there must be a first cause. Well, okay, perhaps there is a first cause to the universe, but, well, that first cause could be anything. It could be completely and utterly indifferent to what I do now. There's also uh, the uh, uh, teleological argument, uh, the design argument for God's existence. Um, this is also subject to uh, numerous skeptical uh, objections, as Kant would have realized when he read the German translation of Hume's Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion, which uh, appeared uh, within 1779, uh, while he himself was uh, formulating this uh, particular argument within the closing parts of the Critique of Pure Reason in, in, in 1780. So, you know, the only way, in actual fact, that we can rationally derive 
the concept of a personal God who is uh, eternal and omniscient, who actually cares about what human beings do upon this earth and uh, you know, who, who actually is himself a moral, omnibenevolent being. The only way, Kant thinks, that we can actually arrive rationally at that concept of God is precisely by deriving that concept of God from the moral law, through precisely this argument. And that all previous arguments for God's existence, well, for a start, they're, they're fallacious, uh, but the other disadvantage that they have is that they don't actually really give us uh, this uh, conception of a personal God who actually cares about what human beings do that most people believe in. Okay, another point that, that Kant makes, I'm finishing, really I'm finishing off, uh, okay, just two seconds. Another point that Kant makes, uh, just interesting point. Well, Kant actually thinks that you know, our, um, uh, our religious conceptions have changed, have actually improved over time as our moral conceptions have improved over time. So, you know, you might look at a study ancient Greek uh, philosophy and uh, uh, the virtue ethics of the uh, ancient Greeks and the ethics of flourishing in which essentially, you know, the, the, the Greeks are, are equating uh, virtue with how to lead a good life and or how to be happy and, uh, uh, and, and this kind of thing. Um, and, but also the, these Greeks um, were polytheists who didn't really believe in, in one God who judges us within an afterlife. Well, Kant actually thinks that this is, not, this is unsurprising. Kant thinks that, well, our moral conceptions have to have become refined. They have to have become uh, improved in order for us to arrive at tr the true religious conceptions. And so throughout the course of human history, Kant thinks, in actual fact, we as human beings have further refined our conceptions of morality. And as we've refined our conceptions of morality, so it's likewise the case that our religious conceptions and our conceptions of God have likewise also improved. Okay, so to conclude, we can therefore see, and I'll take this, this one quote, um, Kant's response, therefore, to the euphrophro problem, he, uh, in which he makes it very clear that in this sense we do not uh, derive uh, we do not derive our morality from God. It's rather the case that we derive our religion from our morality. Kant says. Um, but now, when reason has attained this high point, namely the concept of a single original being uh, as the highest good, in other words, God, it must not undertake to start out from the concept and derive the moral laws from it as if it had soared up to an immediate acquaintance with new objects. For it was these laws whose inner practical necessity leads to the presupposition of a self-sufficient cause or wise world regent. And here we cannot in turn regard these as contingent and derived from a mere will, especially from a will which we would have had no concept at all had we not framed it in accordance with these laws. Kant is very clearly telling us there, we don't get our morality from our conception of God, rather we get our conception of God from our morality. Likewise, also, we don't get our morality from examples or exemplars, as Kant says. Imitation, uh, in this other passage, you know, Kant says, imitation is, uh, has no place uh, within morality whatsoever, because if we see somebody who we think is you know, a perfect example of virtue or a perfect example of morality, who we should imitate, well, first of all, we must have had a pre-existing concept of morality within our heads in order to then compare this potential exemplar against our moral concepts within the first place. So, to conclude, uh, okay, so therefore, you know, Kant's response, therefore, to you for, for a problem, which I started out with, it's really clear. The pious is being loved by the gods because it is pious. Or in Kant's own terminology, morality is willed by God because it is moral. And a quotation, final quotation from Kant. So far as practical reason has the right to lead us, we will not hold actions 
to be obligatory because they are God's commands, but will rather regard them as divine commands because we are internally obligated to them. In other words, it's precisely because we know that certain moral laws emanate from our rational nature that we regard them as likewise being things that God desires us to do. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, now we start our question and debate. Any questions? Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for the talk. Um, I had my first question, which is um, the, the universal law or universal moral law. I find this extremely inapplicable because, you know, it took me four years personally to try to convince my girlfriend that hugging is wrong, and it took her four years trying to convince me that hugging is right, and actually four years passed and nobody convinced the other. So I think that, you know, trying to convince or the human perception of right and wrong is very cultural based. It's not something that we can all agree upon. So what's right here in Egypt can be wrong in, in the United States just because the culture is like that. So uh, using uh, the, the universal moral law as, a, as, 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 a, as an argument is, is very, I, I think, cannot be done unless we can actually prove that something like this can happen. And since I haven't seen something like that happen, I think it's more logical, uh, the other uh, argument, which is, you know what, uh, we are human beings and we have a limited mental capability and God knows what's, you know, what's right and what's wrong, because since we cannot agree on what's, wi what's right and what's wrong ourselves, and he's telling us here, this is what's right and this is what's wrong. I think this, for me, makes more sense than um, just living in the dream of one day we'll all settle on what's right and what's wrong together. That's just a, a personal uh, opinion. Um, regarding the incentive, when you were saying that, uh, um, you know, it's not, it's in order for something, in order for a person to be moral, he has to do the, 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 what the whatever action he's doing just for the incentive of, you know what, because it's good. I find this very hard and very, like, also not practical because, you know, I, I, can't, I can't think of one action that I have done in my life that has just one incentive. There's always multiple incentives that is, you know, there's a main incentive, but there's also multiple incentives to support uh, the action itself. So maybe, maybe another incentive would be, I want to prove to people that I can do good just for the sake of good. That can be an incentive that has nothing to do with good. Do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, so, so having one incentive, I don't, I don't think that has ever happened to me, and I don't think uh, it's, it's very applicable for somebody to say, I do good just because it's good. And, and when it comes to, I'm talking from a religious or Islamic point of view, uh, Avoiding hell and attaining heaven is not the only incentive that, that we're actually forced to, to do good and avoid bad for. That's one of the incentives. And the more we actually elevate, uh, the more uh, or the, less op the more obsolete this incentive becomes. Like our Prophet, Prophet Muhammad, at the end of his life, God told him, you're going to, or he, so he says, yani, uh, you're going to enter heaven. And he still was doing good and avoiding bad because he, th he says that this God is, is worthy of, of, me, of me doing the, this while there's no hell for him. And um, so yes, I think uh, like the, the arguments that were used by Kant uh, to, to prove that, uh, you know, uh, religion does not enforce morality it's the other way around, I think they're very impractical. Uh, uh, that's just a personal opinion. Oh, I think, uh, okay. Um, well, it's, it's, in one sense, it's a very valid uh, personal opinion. I mean, I, I think that there is, uh, I mean, there is, so to, there is, so to speak, uh, a fundamental challenge that you could always uh, launch against Kant's philosophy, uh, which was launched by you know, a great deal of his, um, uh, of his contemporaries, uh, some of those people who, who disagreed. And that is, you know, is there really such a thing as a pure, timeless human reason, which always remains the same? Or is it rather the case that what we call human reason is something which, which is historically, culturally determined and that therefore it changes and it evolves and it differs from place to place? 
Now, you know, in one sense, you know, th th this, is, this is something for which, you know, there is really no easy answer to. You can either believe that you know, human reason is something that is universal, that there is a universal human reason which is timeless and is one and the same within all rational human beings, or you cannot. Okay, there's no really knock, there's no knockdown argument uh, that I can use against you if you refuse to believe that. Apart from perhaps I could ask you to uh, think just a moment about mathematics. And well, within mathematics, you know, surely there, one and the same theoretical reason is being used. Because, you know, surely we can both agree about the truth of Pythagoras' theorem. And, you know, we can, um, you know, if you don't uh, believe in Pythagoras' theorem, if you think it must be false in some way, well, then I can, I can demonstrate to you through a series of diagrams that in actual fact, you know, Pythagoras' theorem is, is true. It is a necessary and universal truth. So, and surely that's the case within all human beings. You know, all human beings even have the capacity uh, to, to see that uh, Pythagoras' theorem is true and to have it demonstrated to them. You know, if they have simply the, a modicum of intelligence, you know, if they, they are a modicum of rationality, then, you know, we all have the capacity to agree about the truth of Pythagoras' theorem. And likewise, you know, if we think about um, uh, physics, for example, well, you know, in physics, you know, a proposition uh, of, of uh, pure physics, for example, well, you know, I mean, that, we can all agree, for example, that within all changes within the material world, the quantity of matter remains unchanged. So, you know, in that sense, within mathematics and within a sort of if the core foundations of physics, it seems as if human reason is universal. Now, why shouldn't it be the same also in morality? Why do we want to say that, well, okay, within, within uh, you know, we, 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 are, we as human beings, we as rational human beings are so constituted in such a way uh, that we all agree, we can all attain absolute consensus within mathematics and we can all attain absolute consensus uh, within physics, and yet for some reason we can't attain absolute consensus within morality. Why should it be like that? Now, some people would say that in actual fact, um, all that Kant is really doing, and again, you know, this is why I've come back to this, this, uh, uh, this particular scheme here, is that all that Kant is really doing when he's putting forward the, the categorical imperative is really just giving us one foundational core of, for deriving moral duties which must be the same for all people, or at least could be the same for all people, just as uh, you know, there is such a thing as pure physics as far as uh, Kant is concerned. You know, there is, so to speak... Uh, uh, a proposition within pure physics would be that within all changes in the material world, the quantity of matter remains unchanged. Or, you know, Newton's laws would be uh, propositions of, of pure physics. The proposition that everything that happens within the world must have a cause, that would be a proposition of, of pure uh, physics. But, of course, you know, that's, that doesn't really constitute much of our study of the physical world. Most of our study, most of our, the facts about the physical world are based upon experience, they're based upon observation, they're based upon experiment, and they're always potentially fallible and changeable when new information comes to light. So in that sense, if we think of physics or natural science in general for Kant, what Kant is effectively saying is that, okay, there is this huge body of natural science, which, which and, na and facts within natural science, which do change over time and are subject to revision. But, he says, this huge body of contingent truths that are subject to revision and change over, over time, they are still based upon this core foundation of a priori necessary and universal truths. Now, 
Could that not be something similar to what Kant is saying here? That's what I would want to suggest. So I would suggest that what Kant is saying is that, okay, you know, there are, so to speak, a number of uh, opinions and traditions uh, that, that we have, um, you know, and these differ from uh, one person to the next, or from one particular religious group to the next, or one from one culture to the next. Uh, they differ over time. They're subject to change. But nonetheless, uh, yeah, there is a key sort of series of foundational propositions underlying all of these, um, you know, th these, um, uh, these mass of, you know, contingent uh, propositions or prescriptions. So, you know, I mean, to, to, to a certain extent, uh, you know, I mean, your, your example about hugging, I mean, I'm not absolutely sure whether, you know, whether not hugging somebody or, or hugging somebody constitutes a moral duty. Uh, you know, I mean, I, th I think I can, you know, I can sort of, I can will quite consistently without contradiction that there's a world in which nobody hugs. Uh, just as I could sort of similarly will without contradiction that there's a will in w there's a world in which uh, everybody hugs all the time, um, you know I mean you know both of them would seem to be perfectly livable as as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so I mean you know the, the conception about the the question about hugging really and you know whether one should hug and whether one should not hug. I mean that doesn't really seem to be a a moral question or certainly not in Kant's sense. It's not really a moral question. It's a, it's a question based upon culture and tradition and cultural values. Um, now, okay, so there are different, you know, cultural traditions, and in some cultural traditions, you know, hugging might be seen as uh, uh, a perfectly normal thing to do, and perhaps within other uh, cultures and traditions, you know, hugging might be something that's uh, slightly frowned upon and... Uh, um, seen as something that you, you don't necessarily want to do too much of in a public place and that kind of thing. Okay, you know, fine, fine. But even so, at the foundations of both of those cultures and traditions, have we not got something that is fundamentally timeless and always remains the same? So, you know, honesty, for instance, surely that is... You know, so surely that is something which is esteemed and approved of in all cultures and all religions. And, you know, not murdering innocent people. Surely that is also a value that is approved of within all cultures uh, and all religions. And so, in that sense, you know, perhaps what, what Kant is suggesting is, is not actually, you know, it's not actually that, uh, that radical. It's, it's not, or, and, or in actual fact, it's not something that actually is inapplicable to the world today, as you suggest. Perhaps it is something that's actually very applicable to the world today. Maybe it would actually be good. Maybe it would actually help uh, uh, the, the state of the world today if, in actual fact, you know, all, uh, you know, all different people from different cultures and different religions could sit down and actually kind of actually see the, you know, the foundation of all of their moral systems are a series of propositions which are more or less one and the same uh, within all different cultures and traditions, so that there is something like a universal global ethic, uh, and that something like uh, the categorical imperative is actually a foundation uh, you know, within all you know, cultures and, and traditions. And now, 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 maybe that is the case, I mean, that is, there, is, there is work being done uh, in the, uh, the Global Ethic Institute in the, the University of Tübingen, in which uh, you know, people have, have worked on um, essentially trying to, uh, trying to show that one can, find, one can find indeed something like the categorical imperative at the, the, foundations, uh, the foundation of all uh, moral and religious systems. And then, in actual fact, these uh, moral and religious systems do have something very, very foundational at their core. Um, now, okay, so th that might be the case, okay. But even if even if it isn't the case, wouldn't it be wouldn't it be good if it actually were the case? Wouldn't it actually be? Wouldn't the world actually be a better place if, in actual fact, we could indeed all 
uh, agree upon basic moral, moral principles that we could all agree uh, that in actual fact it would be better to act in such a way that the maxim for our action is always can be all, always consistently willed to be a universal law that we treat everybody always as ends and we never treat anybody else as means you know in one sense surely that really is something that ought to happen even if it doesn't happen maybe it it ought to happen but the moment that you can in a, you concede, I'm not saying that you should concede, but if you do concede that it is something that ought to happen, then in one sense you also likewise concede that there is such a thing as a universal human reason, which is, you know, what Kant is, is arguing for. So, you know, I mean, the, the one thing I, I would just suggest to you is that, you know, don't think that Kant is actually arguing that absolutely everybody in the same world has, has, has got to be the same all the time. He's not trying to He's not trying to prescribe what you might call a, a global monoculture in which absolutely everybody acts in exactly the same way uh, and that uh, everybody gives up their cultural differences. That's not what he's arguing for. But what he is arguing for is at the foundation of all religious and moral systems, there, there are these basic foundational laws that are shared by everybody. And in actual fact, you know, if it really were the case that everybody were acting in accordance with those foundational laws, then, well, maybe we really would have heaven on earth. And so, you know, maybe that really is an ideal that we ought to see or ought to try and bring about. Okay. Um, as far as what you said about incentives, and you said, well, okay, you know, it's, it is the case that, uh, you know, even when, I, when I'm doing moral actions, um, you know, all sorts of different incentives are kind of motivating me for, you know, whether, whether, no, it's not just, you know, fear of heaven or uh, fear, uh, desire for heaven or fear of hell or, um, you know, there are various different things that could be motivating uh, moral actions. Well, um, or Kant actually thinks that, you know, a lot of actions that we see and actions that we describe as moral, you know, may be, you know, motivated by, um, motivated by all sorts of different inclinations. So, you know, for instance, okay, let's get you know, the example I gave of you know, the, the prince who uh, uh, tries to coerce me to give false testimony in court, and he threatens me that, uh, okay, I'll, you know, if you don't give uh, false testimony, then I, I will kill your wife. Um, and I, I sort of think, well, <laughs> you know, even if he's going to kill my wife, well, you know, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm still going to do the right thing and I'm going to tell the truth, you know, and because, you know, that is an unconditioned duty. And so, you know, I do tell the, I do tell the truth and I, I don't let myself be coerced uh, into uh, committing the slander. But, and you might think, well, gosh, that was, you know, such a, you know, su such a remarkable action, moral action there, because, you know, that person really, even, even, even though his own wife's life was threatened, he still performed his moral duty. But then, well, maybe I, maybe I hate my wife. You know, maybe, you know, maybe I want to be rid of her. Um, so, you know, there might be, I mean, nobody really knows. So, you see, even when we see people acting morally, when we see people acting in accordance with the moral law, we still don't really know whether what they're actually doing is, is truly moral or not. So, you know, uh, sure enough, Kant says, uh, within the world we see many examples of virtue, we see many examples of people acting in such a way that their actions conform with the moral law. But it's very hard for us to decide as to whether they're really being, uh, really being uh, um, uh, moral or not, because we don't know whether there are secret incentives that we're not aware of, which is also are also motivating their actions, and that's precisely why we have to believe in a God, because you know one of the God is the only being who is, who is omniscient, who could actually you know genuinely ascertain whether people are genuinely being moral or not. And sometimes Kant writes as if he's incredibly pessimistic. He sort of writes as if, well, you know, within this world, um, sure enough, we are conscious of the moral law, but whether anybody is really acting in accordance with it for its own sake is a different question. You know, and sometimes he writes as if you know, maybe it's, it's as if absolutely everybody in the world is actually really just uh, 
uh, acting in accordance with you know their uh, private inclinations or their secret incentives and in actual fact there's no genuine moral actions being performed within the world whatsoever you know sometimes he really is that pessimistic but even so